The Lost Sheep of Israel with Bible teacher, Elder Michael Johnson. Teaching the world the true meaning of Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. So, have your Bible, notepad and pencil ready as he goes through today's study. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. I want to welcome everyone to King James Bible University. I'm Elder Michael Johnson from the Lost Sheep of Israel. So today we're going to be going through an interesting part of the Bible, but we're going to be going through a book. So we're going to go through a great part of it today, but many, much of it, we probably won't even complete it in this setting to where we're going to end up going over to another part of it. So I want to ask you to... Um, to bear with us for a minute because we're going to be going through a great a great deal of this and I want to make sure that uh, we, we we make sure that we we understand exactly what's going through here but as I uh, start with it and that's why I have to get ready to set up because we're going to we're going to stay on track because we have to go through a lot of it that I wrote to where we make sure we stay on track at all times so with that we're going to open up with a prayer, but then we're going to jump directly into the lesson to where we get a good understanding of exactly what was actually happening with Hosea. So once we really have an understanding of this, and let me see, I have this on the wrong side. Let me put this on this side to where we can go through it. And... um and we're going to uh, see exactly what is actually happening. Let me open this up and we should get this right through there. So let me set this up here. And yeah, because a lot of this stuff have reset itself. And actually, we're going to start it right there. So. We're going to switch over in a minute. Then we're going to start going through a lot of the things that which we're going to be looking at. So once we open up with prayer, but we're going to find out about Hosea. A lot of stuff that a lot of people have a false understanding under some things. Thinking that Hosea is just one of the many books that is not serious. But Hosea actually connects you to the whole Bible. We're going to see how that actually happens. But we're going to see as we're going through Hosea to which we'll see exactly what Hosea is all about. Because Hosea is one of your most greatest stories that's, that was never told that within Scripture, which many people go out, they teach about Hosea, but really not going into depth exactly what Hosea is really about. So with that, we're going to open up with prayer, then we're going to jump directly into it. And we're going to go through it, and you're going to see many things that's, that you actually probably never knew, but many things that are going to surprise many people. So I'm going to jump back and forth over inside the PowerPoint and coming back to the screen because I don't want this to lock up because we have uh, many people that's actually is tuning in actually out of um, out of the UK. But as I said, we try to keep most of them off of uh, live stream so much to where we keep them on the school side. So with that, we're going to open up and we're going to jump directly into the lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the day. We want to thank you, Father, for blessing each and every person that was able to make it today, dear Father, to where they can commune with each and every one of us. But I ask you, Father, as we continue, we will go through your book today. We're going through the book of Hosea. I ask you, dear Father, to put your spirit on each and every person. Give them a mind, dear Father, to understand what is going through. But all of them that have ears to hear, dear Father, and eyes to see, I ask where you give them a great knowledge and understanding to where once you go through here, dear Father, they can go back and go through the precepts and get a complete understanding of exactly what is going on. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to start with this and we're going to move over to um, to here. Just like I was saying, just bear with us one second and we're going to start right there and we're going to move through and we're going to find out what is actually going on. And some of this I'm even have um, where they're going to be reading it 
for us. So we're going to start right here. We're going to look at the PowerPoint. And as we're going through it, we're going to be going through the PowerPoint also. And it started, it said, um, Hosea came to prophesy during the time of the great political confusion between Judah and Israel. So this is why I have to really write this out because it's a lot of information I'm going to be giving you through here. So as we stay in here, we're going to go in through it. But, but once you start hitting, we start hitting those direct scriptures, you're going to find out exactly what's going on. And uh, it's finished out. It says, Israelites was one, Israelites one time had a single kingdom during the reign of Solomon and David. After the death of Solomon, the country was divided into two independent kingdoms. The southern region came to be called Judah, which consists of the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. So this is what you need to write down. So as we say, make sure you keep a pen and paper. So write this down because a lot of stuff is going to start happening. And we said, pick it up. It says in uh, Jerusalem was their capital. The northern region was called Israel, which comprised of the remaining 10 tribes. They had the capital at Samaria. King Solomon created the wealthiest, most powerful central government the Hebrews would ever see. But he did so at the in, in possibility high cost. The land which was the land was given away to pay for extravaganza, and people were sent in the, into forced labor into Tyre in the north. When Solomon died between 926 and 922 BCE, the 10 northern uh, tribes refused to submit to his son Rehoboam and, and revolted. Moving forward, there will be two kingdoms of, of Hebrews, the northern called Israel and the southern called Judah. The Israelites' northern tribe form, formed their capital in the city of Samaria and the Judeans Southern tribe kept their capital in Jerusalem. These kingdoms remained separate states for the 200 years. And this is where we're going to start really getting into the understanding of what's going on. But we're going to be going through quite a bit. It says, but the region was divided into Judah and Israel. After the death of Solomon, which we just found out, the, uh, the region we came called Judah, which consisted of the 10 tribes, which all of this we already know. It says the history of both kingdoms is a litany of ineffective disobedience in corrupt kings. When the Israelites have first asked for the king in the book of Judges, they were told that only God was their king. When they approached uh, Samuel, the prophet, he told them, uh, told them the desire of a king was an act of disobedience. Clearly understand what this is saying. Because as, as I wrote this, we have to understand clearly when they did that, that's, that's what they were doing. When they was asking for a king and the prophet came and told them, this was a clear act of disobedience. The history was told in the Hebrew books, kings bear, uh, bears out Samuel's warning. The entire Hebrew in, um, empire eventually collapses. Moab successfully re revolts against Judah and Ammon successfully succeeds from, uh, from Israel within a century Solomon's death. The kingdom of Israel and Judah was left as a, as a tiny state, no bigger than uh, Connecticut, which when we look in the United States, it was no bigger than the city of Connecticut. And uh, as it goes on, and as history proves time and again in the region of a, of a tiny state never survived, located between directly through, between the Mesopotamian, uh, Mesopotamian uh, kingdom in the northeast and powerful Egypt south uh, southwest. The Hebrew kingdom was in the innermost commercial and military important of these warnings and powers being small. So this is what we have to remember that that's going on. And then it says... Um, being small, the liability in 722 BC, the Assyrians conquered Israel. Uh, one second. And they conquered is Israel. The Assyrians were aggressive and effective in order to assure they conquered territories would remain um, 
purified, the, the Assyrians would force many of the native inhabitants to relocate to other parts of, the, of their empire. They almost always chose the upper and more powerful classes for they had no reason to fear the general mass of population, they would then send Assyrians to relocate and conquer territory. So, so th what, they, what it's saying here, and the way uh, I wrote it out to, to wait you see what's going on, these classes, you know, it's had the same class as we have today to what you look at. You see where um, people have a very upper class, you have a middle class, and you have a poorer class. This doing this this uh telling you the same thing that I wrote out here. It's it's exactly the same thing. So you had these different classes, and they sent them out based on these classes. Now it says, and when when they conquered Israel, they forced the ten tribes to scatter throughout their empire, for all partial. Uh, this I don't know why that's doing it. They forced all to um for 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 partial proposals. Uh, proposes you might consider this a dysphoria which is which is called the scattering and this scattering also gets into which we're getting ready to start seeing some so except for these Israelites disappeared by name so this is what we have to remember they disappeared by name and that's why I have it in parentheses from history permanently now if you look at Psalms 83 and 4 we'll see this actually what it's talking about to where once I had to do the research here, this is exactly what it's talking about. Well, once you look at Psalms 83 and 4, it says, They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name Israel may be no more in remembrance. So this is why they, they when they did the scattering they, and they and they really wanted to get rid of Israel, this is what they this is what they was doing, and this is what it was fulfilling this. It says, and uh then it says, they'll call the ten lost tribes of Israel. Now, why is that? And where we'll sit there and see, because Jesus even said the same thing, which we're going to read a part that he even said, and it tells you right here, who Jesus came looking for when you look at Matthew 15, 24. It says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, most people always want to sit there and say, you know, uh, Jesus did it a different way. This and that. but Jesus telling you Himself clearly right here. If you look at Matthew fifteen twenty four, it says, "But He answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the house of the lost sheep of the house of Israel." This is who He came for. Now, if anybody joined Himself to them, He will, He will, He will honor all that too. But this is who He actually came for. This is who He came to save. This is exactly what He's saying. Now, it says, now, why this happened is difficult to unravel. This is very difficult to unravel, which I, what I'm saying here is, it's so, it's so weaving in a different way, which in probably the next three, three or four minutes, it's really going to throw off a lot of people because most people are not going to see how deep Hosea is. Hosea is actually the rope which will intertwine you into the rest of the Bible. And give you the understanding that you need. And you're going to see that right here. It says, this is what happened. Oh no, it's weird. But it has to say, I'm not sent to the house, to, to, the lost, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is what happened. So difficult to unravel. But we will take the time and slowly weed through this. And I, I wrote that down. I shouldn't have put that there, but that's okay. You know, but, but literally I put some time, I put my thoughts down. I'm not just going to and write my exact thought right there. But then, it, but then it moves on. It says the Assyrians did not settle the Israelites in one place, but scattered them all over small popula over small populations all over. When the Babylonians later conquered Judah, they too relocated the mass amount of population. However, many of the population Jews were set up in small communities to retain their identity. So, what was going on? The 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 uh, Jews, the other side. They get into the cliques to where they can remain, so they can keep their identity. So once they stay in there, they still continue to worship the way they did. But what they happen later, we we'll see uh, later as we we'll see uh, later on in um, the Bible, we we'll see you know great you know I'm talking great tragedies start happening because they was doing this. 
It says the Israelites departed by the Assyrians. However, they did not live in separate communities. As soon dropped their, their, their Yahweh God, their Hebrew names and identities. Now, we're going to look at the Samaritans because this is what happened. We're going to see how the Samaritans actually is a joining of two names. Because the Samaritans is actually, you're talking about Assyrians, and you're actually mixing them with, uh, with, 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 with Jews. And this is why they was called Samaritans. This is why you see Jesus dealt with them so much. And most people don't know that, but this is what was going on. We're going to see a lot of this as we start getting deeper into this. Because this, this is a lot of stuff we follow before we even get to the book. But I'm trying to give you a synopsis to where once we hit this Bible, we're going to see exactly what was going on. It says the other conquest of the Assyrian invasion of Israel involved the settling of Israel by, by Assyrians. This group settled in the capital of Israel. Samaria. And this is where they did. If you look at a, a Bible map, you'll see this is where they settled. And you'll see this is right, right in the heart of Israel. And it says, and they took many, many of them Assyrian gods and cultic practices. But the people in the Middle East, in the Middle East, were above everything else, uh, else highly uh, superstitious. Even the Hebrews didn't necessarily deny the existence or power of other gods just in case, because they, they, they have been conquered, so they wasn't sure what was going on. They wasn't sure what God they were dealing with. And this is this is where they was losing their faith. Conquering people consistently feared that the local gods would, would, wreak, uh, would wreak vengeance on them. Therefore, they would adopt the local gods or gods into their religion and cultic practices. This is what many of them started doing, because they got scared as if, you know, they, they thought that um, many of them thought that, you know, if they're not doing it because they was conquered and they're not looking at what they was doing was wrong because God told them to obey them, to obey him. And many of them didn't do it. So once they was doing wrong and then they end up getting being conquered, they didn't know it was another guy doing it because they thinking, you know, they started, you know, uh, worshiping an odd way, but still thinking they was honoring God and they wasn't. So this is why they started doing that. But we're going to see even later why why you don't do certain things, but who these people are. So let's let's continue to move forward. And uh, it says, in the other conquest of the Assyrians' invasion, is Israel of all the selling um, Israel by, by Assyria, this group settled the capital of Samaria. I'm trying to make sure this is not the same one. That they, uh, cultic practice, yeah, actually this is a, this is a copy. It says, within a short time, the Assyrians in Samaria were worshiping the Most High God as well as their own gods. So this is what was going on. They, 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 they were worshiping both. They were doing one and the other. It says, within a couple of centuries, they would be worshiping the Most High God exclusively. This was formed the only major division between worshiping the Most High God the division between the Jews and the Samaritans. This was the only difference between them two. So now we have the mixed Samaritans, which was half Assyrians, half Jews, but this was the only difference between them now. And then it says the Samaritans, who were the Assyrian, Assyrians, and therefore considered non-Hebrew. So some who was mixed, and then if they were doing it the other way, they was considered non-Hebrew. So they was actually Jews, but just was considered not because what? They have adopted these, these, some, other, some other false gods and bringing other things into their worship. So what happened here, they adopted most of all the Hebrew Torah plus some cultic practices. That's exactly what we were saying, unlike the Jews. However, they believed that they could sacrifice to God outside of the temple of Jerusalem. This was the biggest problem because the other ones didn't believe you could do that because God, don't, he didn't ordain that. And it says the Jews frowned on the Samaritans denying that the non-Hebrews had a right to be included among those chosen, chosen people and angered that the Samaritans would dare to sacrifice to the Most High God outside of Jerusalem. This is why Jesus even told her, he know they the Jews know who they worship, but they know not, because there was a mixed race. 
They was they was mixed in. And and this is what was going on. So they held it pretty differently, but you if you always notice that these Samaritans always Jesus constantly dealt with them. But he's telling you, but they but now we find out why they was doing what they was doing. We're gonna even see more once we really jump into the scriptures. It says uh, to be included as a chosen people, angered that the Samaritans would dare to sacrifice in the most uh, the most high outside of Jerusalem played a major role of Jesus of Nazareth, which what it did. The Samaritans were half Jew. That's all we that's what we know. This is what was happening. The race came about after the Assyrian captivity, exactly what we was getting into, in the kingdom of Israel. Certain people of the nation of Israel stayed behind. These people intermarried with the Assyrians producing Samaritans, the the so-called nation. So that's where you get these people, where they call themselves Samaritan, or they out of Samaria. This is what was going on. So this is this is why Jesus dealt with them all the time. Now, then said, actually, we actually I have this here. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria? Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Exactly what I was saying, and we are look at our John four and nine, and this is what it's talking about. Then it said, Then said the woman, said unto him, that thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me which is a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealing with, with uh, women of Samaria, with no dealings with, uh, with, with Samaritans. This, this is why Jesus spoke to her. Because she was of, she was of, his, of his tribe, but, he, but she's not knowing. She, you know, they, they completely mixed up because they believe that they are of a separate tribe. Now we'll go to uh, John four nineteen, and we're going to go down to 23. And we're going to see what, what's going on. It says, Now the woman said unto him, Sir, I, prefer, I perceive thou art a prophet, our father's worship in this mountain. So she's half Jew, but she knows this. And this is why Jesus responded to her in that way. And it says, And ye say that in Jerusalem, in this place where men ought to worship, Jesus said unto her, which I said earlier, Woman, believe me, that the hour coming when ye, talking about her, shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So as he even said, telling her salvation is of the Jews, she was part of that, but she's thinking she is Samaritan. She's thinking that she's, she's a, a completely different. That's what that's what she's thinking. But he's telling her exactly what. But watch. He said, but the hour cometh is now when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father seeketh to worship him. Such to worship him. This is what it's saying. But we're going to look at some of this. Another part where we see where these are a mixed race. We're going to see where we're going to see the conquest of also Judah, which actually happened in, in another part. It says, There but for the grace of God go I. Certainly the conquest of Israel escaped the people in, in monarch of Judah. They barely escaped the Assyrians' menace, but Judah would be conquered by the Chaldeans about a century later in 701. The Assyrians uh, ascended them would gain territory over Judah and the Jews would have suffered the same faith as the Israelites. But by 625 BC, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar would, would, would resort central over Mesopotamia and the Jews and the Jew the Jewish king Josiah aggressively sought to extend his territory and power a vacuum as a result. But Judah soon fell victim to the power and struggles between Assyrians, Babylonians, and Egyptians. So this is what was going on. When, when um, Josiah's son of uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, Jehoshaphat, 
became king, the king of uh, Egypt, Nelco, put into power by the Assyrians, rushed into Judah and disposed him. And Judah became a tribute state to Egypt, which they started having to pay money. This is what was going on here. A lot of the stuff I'm going through to where we don't have to read a ton of scriptures, but we're going to get the understanding of what's, ha what's happening. When the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians in 605 BC, then Judah became a tribute state to the Babylonians. So now, then now they're having Judah paying, paying money to, to the Babylonians. But when the Babylonians suffered the defeat in 601 BC, the king of Judah, Joachim, de um, deflected to the Egyptians. So the Babylonian, uh, so the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar raised an expedition to punish Judah in 597 BC. The new king of Judah, Joachim, handed the city over to Jerusalem, over to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, who then appointed a new king over Judah. Zedekiah, the line of Mesopotamia, practiced Nebuchadnezzar deported around. 10,000 Jews to his capital in Babylon, all the deportees were drawn from professionals, the wealthy, and craftsmen. This is what I was saying, these different class of people that they, that they were doing, even though they were all Israelite. Ordinarily, people would be allowed to stay in Judah. This, this deportation was the beginning of the exile, which you will see also when you start getting into Deuteronomy, which... This is what it's going to go directly into Deuteronomy 28, 68. It says, the story should have ended there. However, Zedekiah deflected from Babylon, Babylonians one more time. Nebuchadnezzar responded with another expedition in 588 and conquered Jerusalem in 586. Nebuchadnezzar caught uh, Zedekiah and forced him to watch the murder of his sons. Then he blinded him and deported him to Babylon. Again, Nebuchadnezzar deported the prominent citizens, but the number was so far as, uh, smaller than in uh, 597, somewhere between 832 and 577 people was deported. So nobody really know, but it was a smaller number that, that happened at that time when he was doing this. It says the Hebrew kingdom started with such promise by obeying God's commandments. This is what we see by David was not uh what well, well, was now at an end because this was because they stopped obeying the commandments of God which gets us in trouble because all his blessings is always coupled with it with a curse if we go outside that that peace it's just like being in a fenced city that's why you see where he speaks many times where he talk about fenced cities you're within this fenced city and this is wherever you go when you're keeping the commandments of God and once you go outside that fence, this is where trouble can happen. Same as when you keep children within a fence, things is always is always safe. But once they go outside that fence, they go out into the world, which they break everything and all the laws which you told them to do stay within the fence. So this is the same same analogy in the same analogy that it speaks of in the Bible. It says it will never appear again to be fulfilled. Deuteronomy twenty eight sixty to sixty eight. It says. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships which into bondage by the way thereof. And uh, I speak unto thee, thou shalt see, and no more again they shall be sold to your enemies. So when he's saying you're going to be sold to enemies, anybody you sold to is an enemy. Most people think enemies can become friends. Some people, they, they still be what you want to call a colleague, but they are never are actually a friend because everybody outside of Israelites and you was actually bought or purchased for money. You actually are, they actually are your enemies. So most people, you can look at that how you want it. You can try to switch it around much as you want, but at no time you'll see where he changes that. So most people say, well, I know we came over here on ships and we were sold to a certain class of, of people in, a, uh, in that about this nation, but now we're all fine, well, and good. No, they're still your enemy because you can still see even today what happens to Israelites. You know, you can go through many parts of the Bible and you'll see that your life is actually worth nothing to them when you really get down to it. So that's something just to keep in mind. It says, um, 
to your enemy for buying men and for buying women. It's basically, you're a slave. And no man should buy you. So no man going to redeem you out of it. So that's why you have people who uh, go to, um, they have certain, uh, what they want to call uh, leaders that go and they try to try to make things better or try to get people out of things. But literally, the only one can get you out of this bondage is God. That's it. So many can come out and say that they can do these things. And, and many have said that, you know, they had a dream that, you know, they seen, uh, you know, everybody playing with each other and everything, you know, supposed to be all hunky-dory. These are basically lies that put out that they are still basically wording out the Bible, but you'll see none, none of these things really never happen. You'll still see people killed in the same fashion today as it was three, 400 years ago. It's no different. They just do it. Now they're just doing it with, with a badge. It's no difference. So this is something you always keep in mind. It says, and it seems as, as if Israel is uh, as a nation would ever exist again. As uh, it also seems as if a special bond of God had promised to the Hebrews, the covenant which the Hebrews would, would serve a special place in history had been broken and forgotten by their God. But it's not. It's actually was done on our end. Because we're the one that actually broke the covenant. It says this period of confusion caused many people to put aside Israel and call all people spiritual Israel, which that's what they do exactly today. It is this true. And seeing this, neither one is true because Israel, he never let go. But he said, but we will forget our, who we are. That's what it says. We, if you go over to um, Isaiah 1, two, uh, 1 to 3, you see, we forget who we actually are. And there's no such thing as spiritual Israel. So anybody ever come tell you, well, now he's changed it to the church or he changed it to spiritual Israel. That's the biggest lie you'll see because you'll never see it in the Bible. And it says, uh, do the Bible have scripture supporting this in precepts, which I wrote that in there, which I was supposed to use as a note, but, but we'll go past that. It says, what's worse, Jeroboam is the second captured much of the Syria for Israel. Now, now watch how this, and then you're going to see it get really crazy. And then it says, and within uh, uh, two year, decades or 20 years, Israel and Syria now is confederate, and then they attack Judah. So we have literally Israel, and we have Judah. Now, Israel has Syria to help attack Judah and they, because they confederate with one another. They, they, they partner. So they, they're attacking their own brothers. It says uh, in Hebrews, which we'll see one thing, which we, we'll get this. It says, it says um, Hebrews 8 and 8, for finding fault with them, he said, behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Behold, the days has come, said the Lord, I will make a new covenant, which is Jeremiah 31 and 31. And saying this new covenant, he's making it with who? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, we're going to start jumping directly into this now, where, where we're going to see what, what God is talking about. And most people need to be prepared for this because we get ready to jump into a lot of things now to where I really need you to really pay attention to what is getting ready to happen because most people, just as I said, Hosea ties you to all the Bible, which is going to open up your knowledge to a lot of things. So we want to find out what prophets was involved in this because he said he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with Judah. But we're scattered everywhere. So what we have to understand is Hosea cannot do this by himself. But Hosea gives you the the the, the strain to where you can get every, everybody tied in to get the understanding because he tells you in a, in more of a parabolic way. Well, we're going to find out all that because we're going to unravel that right right here. And we're going to see some of it right here in a little bit because most people think, you know, Hosea talks about many different things, which I'll get into in one second, but we're going to see exactly what was happening here. So let's jump right back into the, to the PowerPoint. And we're going to see here what, what was going on. It says Hosea, one in one. 
This is where we're going to start and we're going to look into our books. And now we're going to jump into this, but we're getting ready to find out what is actually going on. We're going to see exactly what the Bible is actually saying, not in a celestial term, in a terrestrial term, but people who actually understand the Bible. This is what we're getting ready to get into. Hosea 1 and 1. It says, The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Ahaz, uh, Jotham, uh, Isaiah, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. Now, I'm going to have some other stuff read also, and I'm going to set that up real quick. Let me... um. Let me get some of this because I'm a, cause we're going to get into it. I'm talking about it's getting ready to get very, very serious real quick. And we're going to find out some things that you really did not expect. So the Most High God has some prophets involved in this prophecy. And we're going to see another one that was involved in this prophecy. But what other one was involved in this prophecy about what this is talking about? We're going to look at Micah. This is a comparison but this is also another prophet was directly involved in this prophecy. And we'll see Micah 1 and 1. And the word of the Lord that, that came to Micah, the, the, the Moroshite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning what? Samaria and Jerusalem. All right, it's starting to click. Because now we're having the same thing. Now we're having two prophets that is speaking about two nations. That is really one nation that was split up. But they not well, we're not done yet. That's a comparison, but we still have another one who was in there. Let's keep going down. It says, in all the grieving images thereof, which this is Michael 1, 1 7, in all the grievances. Uh, graven images thereof shall be beaten into pieces and all the hires thereof shall be burnt with fire and all the idols thereof shall lay I lay desolate and, and she gathereth uh, it if hire of a harlot exactly just understand what this is saying that they should return to the hire as of a harlot now this is Micah getting on because what? What, what, what what we talked about earlier they was going in, worshiping what? Two gods. This is what Michael was dealing with. So they dealing with two gods. Like I said, they were taking two gods in there. They'll deal with the most high when they was coupling it with some something today. Well, something in that day. They doing that today. They they like to go in to a church and then you'll see some where they have a cross in the back. They have a, a false Christ uh up there, up on a cross. They have many things. They're doing both, and they're actually worshiping the false god. Because he tells you at the beginning, have no images of him. Even though that's a completely false image of him, because it don't depict him no way the way the Bible describes him. But you're still worshiping this false god. This is part of the problem. Now, he also had another. Um, he also had another prophet involved in this, and we're gonna see the other prophet which is Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah 1 and 1. So now we have three prophets involved. And it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which is still talking about. Now Jerusalem, now Judah is one, and Jerusalem is talking about another one. In the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of what? Judah telling you the same thing because Jerusalem is what? Just think about it. We're going to think, we're going to let you think about it. We're going to move down some because now we're going to see another one was still involved. We go, now we're saying it's not one prophet involved in this where each one of them having a separate thing. We see they all tied to the same thing because they got to get these two broken sticks back to one. And God's showing you this was no small feat. So he had many prophets to join in on this. And who, who was one of another one? Because 
we seen all the other three, but it's still another one. We getting ready to look at another one, who is of the tribe of Judah, which is Amos. And we're going to look at Amos 1 and 2. Again, this is another one tied to the same thing. It says, the words of Amos, who was among the, the, the Herodim of Tekoa, which I taught on Tekoa, but it says, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of what? Hezekiah, king of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the kings of Israel. Now you see, he's dealing with the other side. And then it says, two years before the earthquake. And we're going to find out what that's talking about. Going to hit verse two. And then it says, and he, and he said, the Lord will roar from Zion and, uh, and utter his voice from Jerusalem in the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn and the tops of, of Carmel shall wither. Now, this is still, we still, we still dealing with more prophets. But we're going to see this also, with this, it includes what? We're going to see, it's going it to get to Jeremiah, who, uh, uh, Jail Kim hated his preaching. And we're going to see even part of this, where you're going to get to it. He's preaching, if you go to, if you go to Jeremiah 36, 1 and 26, which we're not going to have time to, to read that in that because that will be going too far. What did I say? It's, it's, it's way deeper than what you see. This is why we can't do this in one city. Because if you look at it, uh, uh, Jeremiah 36, 1 to 26, you'll see what happened. And um, Zedekiah, uh, Zedekiah was the last king of Judah for unwilling to do what? For unwilling to take advice of Jeremiah. And we, now we're going to look at Jeremiah. And we're going to do Jeremiah 1, 1 to 1, 3. And it says, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hezekiah, of the priests that were uh, in Astral in the land of Benjamin. But watch as it keep going. To whom the word of the Lord in the day come to Joash, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came in the days of Joachim, which we were talking about, in the sons of Joash, king of Judah, unto the ends of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captivity in the fifth month. Now, we're not even done with the with with, with the prophets. Jeremiah was was a was of the uh, priestly family, the tribe of Benjamin. But Jeremiah had a scribe who was a prophet. In this, in some of this stuff, you're going to see if you don't have a apocrypha, some of you are not going to see, but you're going to see it if you have just a regular um, the Bible that's based in the U.S. But his scribe name was, was Baruch, who was another prophet involved in this. And we're going to see some of this right now. Still, Jeremiah 36 in one, we're going to go through one through six, and we're going to see some of that right here. It says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Joash, king of Judah, that the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee. Against what? Israel. And against Judah. So he's writing against both. Because what? Because they're acting silly and, and attacking, they're attacking each other. And they're supposed to be brothers. And he said, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto them from the days of Joash, even until this day. Even until this day. What are you talking about? Until right now. And actually, that's why if you even see in the thing, before I get into it, you even see right now, we have even um, uh, uh, the Bloods and Crips. Same thing. That's why you see that blue up there, why he put that there. Same thing, fighting against each other. We all supposed to be one, but we're going against each other. But let's hit three. It says, and it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I propose to do unto them that they may return every man from his evil way that I may forgive their iniquity and their sins. Because that's what he's looking to do. He want to forgive them for what they're doing, but they just doing what they do. This is what we be doing. Verse 4. Then Jeremiah called 
Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from, the, from his mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him uh, upon a roll of a book. But we're going to see some of this that he, that he did. But, we, but some of this that we're going to go into, you have to go into the Apocrypha, which we're going to get into in one second. In Jeremiah, we're going to go to five. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. This is why he couldn't do certain things. I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. This is why he couldn't do it. He had to petition Baruch to do it. Verse six, therefore, go thou and read in the roll which thou has written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. Now, this is the same thing which I was saying. Now, this is what he commanded Baruch. And if you see a regular Bible, even this is one that's even not one with the apocrypha, you will see this in there. And most people just look over it. But watch this. We're going to go into Baruch, which is in the apocrypha, and we're going to find out what happened here. But, but we're going to hit uh, Jeremiah 32 and 12. It says, And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Manasseh, in the sight of uh, Hamiel, mine uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses, that the scribe of the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of prison. Now Baruch, as I said, was another prophet of the tribe of Judah used. Now we're going to move down. Baruch, if you have your apocrypha, open up to Baruch. We're going to go to Baruch 1 and 1 through 4. As I said, he, he had a lot of, he had a lot of, he had a lot of them involved in this. So we're going to get down in there. It says, Baruch 1 and 1, it says, and these are the words of of the book, which Baruch, the son of Nazariah, so you see it just spelled a little bit different, the son of Manasseh, which is spelled a little bit different, because you know each writer always writes a little bit different. The son of Sadducee, the son of uh, Adides, the son of, of um, Chalisiah, wrote in Babylon. That's where, that's where he wrote it for Jeremiah. In the fifth year, in the seventh day of the, of the month, what time of the, of the Chaldeans took Jerusalem and burnt with fire. And Baruch did read the words of the book in the hearing of what? Jeconias. It's telling you exactly who's, who's, who's doing this. The son of Joachim, king of Judah, in the ears of all the people which came to hear the book. Verse 4. And in the hearing of, of the nobles, and of the king's son, and of the hearing of the elders, and all the people from the lowest unto the highest, even all them that dwelt in Babylon by the river Sud. Now, we now we're going to get into some other people who were still involved. This still has some other prophets involved. We we dealing with just a just like I keep saying, we not dealing with a small matter here when you're dealing with Hosea. But another prophet involved, most people don't know of, is uh, Shemamiah, which we're going to also see, which is another prophet, which is a man of God that got involved in this. And we're going to see that, and we're going to find that over here in 1 Kings. And you're going to look at 12 and 22. Just like I said, this is a big intertwine, which we have to figure out what's going on. It says in 1 Kings 12, 22, but the words of God came unto Shemamiah, the man of God sing. Then came Shammai the prophet to Rehoboam to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shechai and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord. You see, he's coming, and that's what the prophet, that's, that's one of the key words that they always use when you know it's a prophet dealing with it. And it tells you, right, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, therefore I have also lifted you in the hands of Shaikiah 
And um and then later, actually that was cut off. Actually, um uh, we go well, I actually just gonna pick up anyway, but let's move down. It says later we'll see the power of the prophet uh uh Shemaiah had when Rehoboam and the Israelites met that fateful day in, in Shittim, everyone assumed that Rehoboam would become Israel king. The people made a simple, reasonable request to Rehoboam after the consulting with others. This would be the kings ignorantly rejected it. The people renounced him and their king and went their way. Reconciling might have might have um, occurred had Rehoboam not acted so acted so uh, acted foolishly. The result was a divided kingdom, and unattended uh, consequences would have shaped the history of this nation to this very day. And this is why I actually put it that way because to this very day we had the same issue. This is the great turning point in history of Israel. One of the critical of our understanding of the Bible, from this point on, the southern kingdom would be known as Judah. Understand why I'm putting it this way, because from now on, this is how it's going to be known. With Jerusalem as its capital and one of David's descendants as their king, the northern kingdom, composed of ten tribes, would be known as Israel. Samaria would eventually become its capital. You see, you see why he, why he's dealing with that town, and it says, and uh, eventually we come to capital. And his dynasties would frequently change. At times, the two kingdoms would be at war with each other, and at other times, they will make certain alliances. in in the glory days of the United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon are gone. First Kings. We're going to start at 12, and we're going to go down, and we're going to let it read itself. But I'm going to set up, because I'm a, I have it to where we're going to read all the 12, and we're going to see exactly what it's saying there. So we're going to go to 1 Kings, and we're going to go to 12, and we're going to see what it says there. And we're going to hit the whole part of 12. So so let's go through, because I'm going to have it, it's actually going to be read. And we're going to read all the 12 there. So let's pick it up at, at 1 Kings 12. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel will come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, if thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, See, this is this is where the problem kicked in at. See, because he didn't listen to that, that, that what, what he was telling him what to do. They told him exactly what they should do, and they'd be his servants forever. But he chose not to do that. This is where this is why it kicked in that way. What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter? And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thou shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Now, you see now you see how he's going? I'm talking about he, he, he's telling one thing, and he's going to make it even heavier because he thinks he's somebody. But they're going to change up on him because he's going to have to get up out of there. 
because these people are not going to deal with him in this way. He's he's telling them what he's going to do. And when you're king, you're supposed to judge people fairly. And he's telling you what he's going to make them. He's going to make everything worse. But let's see what's going to happen. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this. This is what I was saying. So this is where the whole problem kicked in at. So they all rebelled against the house of David because he's telling them what they're going to do. And, and they just wanted something a little bit lighter than what was going on. But he's sitting there saying, no, I don't care what you ask for. I'm going to do this. He's not listening to wisdom, but he's listening to his little friends. Because he's sitting there with his chest stuck out thinking, hey, okay, I'm going to show them who I am. I'm going to show them I'm a batter, I'm a batter king. And this is, this is the problem. And we even had that problem to this day. This day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation, and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, and hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam the son of Solomon. So you see right here, now... They already done split up. But now he's going to try to get them back by what? By force. So so we have to understand exactly what, what is going on. And we're seeing way over here in Kings. But really, Hosea, we're going to see what Hosea is even talking about. Because Hosea is actually talking, speaking of this. This is all Hosea really talking about all the time. And we're going we're gonna to see that in one second. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearkened, therefore, to the word of the Lord, and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. So you see, Shemaiah was another prophet. Would would to go tell him the same thing, but this don't matter. See, this is this is why the Lord said we are a stiff-necked people. We obey for a little second. Our, our attention span is so short; it's unreal, and we still gonna turn from this right now. This is why we have to go on the twelve. This is why Hosea said said what he said because the Lord had him to go this certain way. But we're gonna start getting into Hosea in a certain way. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them it is too much for you to go up to jerusalem behold thy gods o israel which brought thee up out of the land of egypt and he set the one in bethel and the other put he in dan and this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto dan and he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of levi 
And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So, as I said, he, they're doing the same thing that they were doing in Egypt. When he first even took them out of Egypt, what they started doing? They sacrificing the calves. They're doing the same identical thing. So this is why it's so important because he didn't want them to do it in the same place anymore because he was talking about it too dangerous because he wanted to keep his power there. So this is why they did what they did and they're going to doing these calves, but we're going to understand. But what did the Lord say? The Lord said, hold them, don't do this. This is why Hosea was prophesying what he was prophesying. We're going we're gonna to finish this out. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Now, now these are lessons that's learned from Rehoboam, uh, Solomon's son. And Jeroboam, Israel's first king, we're going to listen to the scriptures to see and learn the lesson from Israel history that God has for us. And this is this is part of the biggest problem that we continue to go through. Let's see here. Uh, we're going to go right here to Romans. We're going to look at 15 and 4. And it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So these things that was written before was written for our learning. The Old Testament was for our learning. And it tells you, in that we through patience in the comfort of scriptures might have hope. So we, same people know, same people love to say, if you know where you came from, you can know where you're going. But most people like to go right to the newest testament and not look at uh what's going on, and they like to start writing the new. And they don't know have a slightest idea where they came from. This is the biggest problem today. This is where you get spiritual Israel from. Because they're not even knowing what was going on back there. So when Jesus said that he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they don't know. They don't even know all these all these prophets. And I still haven't even finished with the prophets. Because there's more prophets involved in this. But we're going to see as we continually go through here and seeing what was going on because this was a very serious deal that's even going on to this day. Because now many of us, you can tell people today that you are Israelite and people won't even believe you. I don't care how you do it, how you twist it, flip it, turn it around, they will not believe what you're saying. They believe the people that's sitting over in the land that's named Israel are the true people. And he even tells you in the last book that to them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogues of Satan. And we will continue to believe, well, those are the chosen people. He said he's going to gather his people, but they gathered themselves and put themselves over there in that land. And then everybody wants to say those are the chosen people. And this is one of the biggest lies that, that, that's put out there. Now we're going to look back at these issues. Israel started a war with Judah, but couldn't win. So they started a confederate with Syria and fought against Judah, which, which we were talking about. Now we're going to look at Isaiah 7 and 9, which um, I believe I did have that one also queued up. And we're going to look at Isaiah 7, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to let that one go also. So we're going to start at uh, Isaiah 7. And it came to pass. Uh, one second. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Exactly what I was saying. So... Even what I told you when Syria was was confederate with, with, with Ephraim, exactly all that we've been saying in, in uh, the, uh, early in time. Once they're in confederate, they're in, they're in cahoots with each other, but they use that 
to conquer the other one. And then later they get turned on. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and she are Jashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus, see, this is exactly, so now they're going to even, what they want to do, they're going to take over Judah, they're going to even put a false king in, then they're going to actually kill him. This is what, this is what was going on all through the Old Testament. This is what's a mix up. This is why we got split up. This is why we went into the disparia. This is why what happened when you get over into the Apocrypha, what was going on. Then you have Epiphanes, one of the, one of the uh, evil king, who actually even said that you ain't going to even be called by your name. You are, we're all going to become one people. Now you have people of uh, Israelites thinking that they're Greeks. I'm talking about this. Is, I'm talking about it just continued. I'm talking about it went from the Babylonian Assyrian from the Mesopotamia all the way up and it just continues to where you were completely conquered. So let's finish this out. Saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken that it be not a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. So he's even talking about, so he's telling you that Ephraim not even going to be a people. So we have to understand, and then he's going to say, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is, is Remaliah. Uh, son, if you will believe, surely ye shall not be established. So he's sitting there telling you this, but I want you to understand something in here, because I also remember Gilad and Galilee. Keep those if you if you taking notes on this, please write that write that down. Galilee and Gilly in uh in um in Galilee. Just write that down because this is gonna be play another important part on how we're gonna actually attack it. We actually attacking Hosea and we haven't even got to verse four to which we're gonna get an understanding on our ho on Hosea just from one to four. This is all we get an understanding on. Just that alone. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. So we're going to look at uh, 2 Kings 15, 29 to 33. 2 Kings 15, 29 to 33. It says, And the king of Abakiah, king of Israel, came to Tagalab, uh, Piazar, uh, king of Assyria, and took Ijon, and Abelbath, um, Micaiah, and John, uh, Genoa, and Kedesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee. Uh, just keep those. Just keep those two cities in mind. All the land and the follies, and carried them captive to Assyria. But just keep that in mind. Keep those two cities in mind. It says in Hosea. The son of uh, Eli made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead of the twentieth year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. You see, you see what's going to have, going on because Hosea comes and actually prophesies against them as well as the other ones. Uh, then it says in the rest of the acts of Pekah, all in all, all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And in the second year of Pekiah, the son of, of, of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uriah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old, when he was began to reign, he was he he uh, and and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother name was Jeshura, the daughter of Zedah. This is your key 
to the entire part to where you can get the key of all of Hosea. And the reason why we're going to find out what's going on here, because we're going to find out a couple of keys in here, which if you keep them, if you keep them there, you would never get lost in Hosea. Cause this is your key over in, in second Kings, because what we're going to find out your Uriah, the son of Jotham, the mother was named, um, Jeshua, which is the daughter of Zeta. The key is Jeru or Jesu or what? Or Jerusalem. That's what that's what it's actually saying because it's going to use that same prophetic language later in Hosea. In Jezreel, which we're going to see, which is going to be one of the other kids' name, is who? Israel. So keep these in mind because this is how he joins them together. So just remember, Jeshua, which and it makes no sense why he even names her, didn't even name the daughter of Zeta. It actually makes no sense if you look at the Bible, but he gives you these keys to which you need to make sure you keep in there because he gives you little bitty snippets. And once we do the studies, he gives you these snippets to which he can give you the way you can tie the Bible together. But what we're going to find out is Jezreel, which you can even look in there and you can even see Jezreel is actually a city. And it's actually in Israel. But we're going we're gonna to see all that. Now, let's go to Hosea. 1, 1, 1 to 1, 5. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get the understanding there. It says, the word, the word of the Lord came to Hosea to say, the son of Beri, in the days of uh, Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go unto unto thee and take a wife of whoredom, the children of whoredom, for the land have committed, for the land have committed a great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Now, this right here, we're going to see even in one second. Now you know this is breaking God's law if he if they take a wife of whoredom. So he's not saying take a wife that, that actually goes out and commit physical adultery. That's not what he's saying. This wife of whoredom is out there worshiping everything other than God. But they but they will tell you that, that Hosea took a wife of whoredom, but you'll see even later that this is not true. Because Hosea, if he married a prostitute, God will be breaking his own law. See, these are things, this is why this is why it's so important. The scriptures can't be broken. And if you break the scripture, it'll show you with God breaking his own scriptures all through that. It'll show that he was wishy-washy. And he's not a wishy-washy God. So when he said that, uh, he said, he said, a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom, because she's a child of whoredom. They've been committing these, this, this whoredom for years. Hundreds of years now. For the land, it's telling you, for the land have committed a great whoredom, departing for what? Departing from the Lord. And he went and took Gomer, the daughter of a Debla, which conceived and buried him a son. Now he buried him a son, but then people want to say that she buried a son, could be from somebody else. And no, it came directly from Hosea. But she was just out there worshiping everything under the sun. But watch this. It says, and the Lord said unto him. So he ain't not going to even let him name him. He's going to name him. Said unto him, call his name Jezreel, is what I said. Keep that name in mind. That's Israel. That's all he's saying. For yet a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of who? Jeshu, which is the same thing, which is talking about the woman, which I just told you, which was the daughter of Zedah. This is all he's saying. Who what? She was a part of Judah. She was a part of Jerusalem, which is saying. It says, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel and it shall pass in the days I will break a bowl of Israel in the valley of where? In Jezreel. Right right there. So now we're going to even see where it's talking about. We're going to define this, this, this wife, as I told you, to where God can't break his own law. This is why you, you have to prove everything based on precepts. You have these, you have these people out there, they want, to, they want to continue to go out and teach the word of God, but then they don't want to give you the truth of God because 
they going out telling you Hosea, God told Hosea to marry an actual whore, and then the children was not even his. And not even doing the precepts on this to where they saying where God just, I'm talking about just wishy-washy God, and, he, and he's not. We're going to look at Leviticus 21 and 7, and we're going to see here even his law. It says, Thou shalt not take a wife that is a whore, or profane, neither shall he take a woman that put her away of her husband, for he is holy unto God. So it's telling you, he is holy unto God. But guess what? The Bible, the, the part of the Bible they took out on you, that's in the pocket for, we're going to see, we're going to see even more so where, um, where um, it gets even deeper into it because Tobit actually defines this whoredom even more. We're going to look at this. We're going to go to Tobit 4 and 12. So if you have your pocket for, we're going to look at Tobit 4 and 12. It says, Beware of all whoredoms, my son, all whoredoms to chiefly take a wife of the seed of thy fathers. Take not a strange woman to wife. Now, what is a strange woman? A strange woman to where something is not of your nation and also a wife that's sitting out there that's selling herself. But he's going to define this. He said, take not a strange woman which is not of thy father's tribe, which what I was telling you. So you're not to take one that is not of the tribe of Israel, period. But you have many of them doing this. So many of them have this part taken out of the Bible, but when they read this, they'll see that they was committing a whoredom. This is, this is one of the problems. This is why a lot of people don't even want this in the Bible. This is why a lot of people is not going to accept the Apocrypha because the Apocrypha tells you so much truth. It's giving you so much history on what we are not to do and we continually do. So we have to understand exactly what we're not to be doing and we have to understand that. So it says, uh, of the tribe, for they are the children of the prophet. So the women that you're marrying is from the children of the prophets. But if you're going marrying these strange women that worship in everything other than God, anybody, all these women that are non-Israelites, we want to be very pacific in they doing this, this is what he's saying. And then he's going to be even more pacific because he's going to say the children of the prophets, Noah, which is Noah, so you just see in here where Tobit spells it N-O-E, but it's talking about Noah. Then he, because he's going all the way back. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, my son, that our fathers from the beginning, even all, even all they married, uh, married wives of their own kindred. This is in the Bible. This is what he's saying. And we're blessed and their children and their seeds shall inherit the land. So whoredom is not taking a wife of the Most High God chosen people. Just something to remember. This is what we got to get into and what we have to understand. So this is what we're going to end here because I know I gave you a lot of, <laughs> a lot of information, which is getting into a lot more which uh, we're going to be diving into a whole lot of other stuff in, um, in the coming weeks because this tells you a lot of stuff. But what we have to remember is we're dealing with more prophets on this same deal. We're dealing with so many different books and everybody's doing the same thing. So we have to understand exactly what we're doing all the time. Because it's, as Toby tells you, seeing you have people sitting there saying, you know, you're going certain places where they doing certain things and you think everything is fine. But he's telling you we're not to be keep committing these type of whoredoms. So most people still think that in here that they were doing the main thing with um with them is sitting there thinking that, you know, they can um they can deal with Jezreel. And Jishu, which is speaking of the same thing, which uh, we can go through that same vision here. And I don't think we have time, which uh, we can look at uh, as Isaiah 1 and 8. And we, we probably push this a little bit further. We'll look at it a little bit more. And we'll uh, let's go into it. Um, Isaiah 1, 1, 1 to 1, 8. 
And it says the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, was saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So it's still telling you the same thing. So Judah and Jerusalem, talking about Israel. And it says in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So he hasn't changed anything. But it says, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought ye children, and brought up children that they have rebelled against me, in which they have done. And it says, Now 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 look at this and you understand what, what the main problem is. It says an ox know of his owner, and an ass his master crib. Now an ox knows his owner. I'm talking about he goes to some of the dumbest animals in the world and he and the Lord is prophesying this to us and he's telling you an ox knows his owner and an ass is master crib. But it says, but Israel not know my people don't consider. So we don't even consider ourselves Israel because we're too stupid to even understand who we actually are. Even when you have people come to tell you who you actually are. This is one of the biggest problems in the Bible. God speaking to you, telling you who you are, and then he even give you teachers and preachers to come to you to show you who you are. And we're so stupid, an ox knows, it, an ox knows his own and ass his master crib because you take a jackass to five miles away and working and he can, and when you let him go, he'll walk his butt right back to the same house where he came from. We so stupid to where we can't figure out Israel do not know. We don't consider. As soon as somebody tell you that you're Israel, the first thing you'll sit there and do, you'll tell them they're a lie. First thing you want to do, you want to say you're African American, you're Negro, you um, you are black, you 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 name you anything that they want to change to you Afro American, you want to change your name to everything that they want to change to African American, something I never would accept and never do and never will accept. You name that the two continents, African American. That don't even that's the stupidest thing be going on. But people are proud to say that, and you have people even today, and they they proud to even tell you that. And they named after two continents. And God constantly telling you, you're Israel. Stupidest thing in the world, but this is what we do. So that's why he sit there and put that uh, ox nose his owner and the ass his master crib. But Israel, not know. We don't know what. We don't even know who the hell we are. This is the biggest shame in the Bible. This is why he sit there and talk to us in this way. So... We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go down in here. And then he said, my people do not consider. And then, it, then he even goes in more. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corrupt. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. And they are going away backwards. So this is what it's talking about. But we have to understand exactly what we're doing, folks. So we're going to get more into this and we're going to cut it off right there to where we can get the understanding. But go back, precept it, get the understanding, and then we're going to pick this up right here from, um, from Isaiah 1 and, 1, uh, 1 and 8. And we're going to continually move down and, and find out exactly what Hosea was talking about because we haven't even got completely all the way through a Hosea. So, but we now know when Hosea started talking about his children, now we know these children that he's talking about. So with that, I wish you was richly blessed, and I hope that we will continue to get these understandings, and we're going to continue to go through the book of Hosea to where we're going to understand exactly what Hosea was saying all the time. So once you go through it, so when you see right now, when you go through Hosea, you see them wife of Hordom, you see who Jezreel is. It's talking about Israel. Jesus is talking about, is telling you exactly what he's talking about Judah. So now you know who these are. But as you continually read this, we're gonna sit there and we're gonna we're gonna dissect each one and we're gonna figure out who each one is. We're gonna find out, low and me, we're gonna find out everything, who these who he's talking about, what he's talking about, why he's saying it the way he's saying it. We have other prophets gonna actually even clarify it. Cause they all were sent together, and this is one of the greatest stories that was never told that was that's directly in the Bible that we continually Go over, look over, breeze through, not watching it, not just seeing that these all these scriptures are isolated, and many of them is all together. We have many of these prophets, I'm talking about, they, they intertwine with each other, and they even knew each other. But we sit there and thinking that we go, we go to these false teachers, and they're sitting there teaching us about the Bible, and they're not teaching us about anything. 
So with that, I wish that you was richly blessed. We will continue this, and we'll pick this up on next week. I will be doing some of some some more some more clarification tomorrow morning, which I'll be doing for uh, Dr. Aliezer over in the UK. So if you want to tune in on that one, what we will do, many people that's in the school, I will have some. I'm not sure if it will be on live stream, but what I will do, I will place a link to where you can go on the back side of. Um, of the, of the UK side of the school to where you will actually will be able to view it. So if you tune in in the morning, you'll see a, you might see a link there or you might see the video. I'm not sure how they might do it. So if the link is there, it will, it, it'll give you the link to where you can actually see the video on the other side. So with that, I wish you a richly blessed and I bid everyone a shalom.